When uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were on the moon, Buzz described it as a magnificent desolation. I think the way that they portrayed that very first lunar exploration, the original reality TV that, uh, that the Apollo 11 landing was, I think that really set the standard for me. And my entire career as an astronaut, I did my absolute best to share the experience with as many people as possible, to, to use words, to use images, to use music, every means I could to not keep spaceflight to myself. I've flown in space three times, three different rocket ships, been around the world uh, almost 2,600 times. It deepens what you believe. It widens your perception of what is normal. And it absolutely entrenches a fundamental uh, feeling of connectedness for the entirety of the world. You don't see your particular little piece of the world as being some uh, extremely significant part. You recognize that it is part of the collective whole. So much of life is, is not being ready for things that happen. And if you're not ready for what's going to happen, then uh, perhaps it may cause damage to you if it's something dangerous, or at least you'll miss opportunities if you're not ready for things. And the life of an astronaut is to get ready for things that might happen. It is to visualize failure. It's to constantly be preparing for the most probable things that might occur. And I think the biggest lesson uh, that I internalized as a result of having served as an astronaut is to, uh, is to forever visualize what's coming up and try and gather all the personal skills so if and when it does happen, I can, uh, I can react the right way. And, Make the most of it. Uh, during 21 years as an astronaut, I spoke, I couldn't count the number of schools I spoke in uh, to, to so many people. And during that time, I realized it's not just space stories, but it, it's what about space flight that is useful on Earth. That's the part that really matters. What, not just the experiments we do, but what are the personal lessons out of it? How to deal with danger, how to deal with fear. Uh, how not to let one big event in your life uh, make everything else seem pale in comparison. And in, in writing this book, I just tried to put those lessons uh, in print. And I wanted this to be a useful book. And I am delighted to see that people found it useful, that it's been a bestseller all around the world. It's in 17 languages. Uh, to me, that's just... Um, a lovely result of the fact that people think the lessons that I learned in order to fly a spaceship are in fact uh, useful here for life on Earth. When you're laying on your back in a rocket ship, almost nothing else matters except what's about to happen. Uh, and, and we express it in the cockpit by saying, okay, what's the next thing that's going to kill us? What's the next thing that's going to kill us? Because if you're not ready for that, nothing else does matter. You have to be absolutely focused on the immediacy of, of reality. And once you've trained that way for years, I did it as a fighter pilot, then as a test pilot, and then to an incredible degree as an astronaut, it just becomes pervasive in how you treat everything. And if you realize that nothing's about to kill you, <laughs> then you could relax, because it's just things that are happening right now. But if there's a major threat coming, then you want to identify it and think, okay, the next real major threat is this. Do I have my act together? Do I know what skills I need to have? Have I done my homework? Have I planned ahead? Do I know what my first five actions are going to be? And once you've got those squared away in your head, then you can be calm. And in fact, come into almost every situation, instead of feeling nervous with your fingers crossed, you, you just feel confident all the time. I think. Uh, unlike a Chihuahua, I think it's a better way to go through life. In uh, An Astronaut's Guide, there are a few pictures, including a very small number of pictures that I took from the International Space Station. But I, I took 45,000 pictures while I was in space, and this just wasn't enough. Uh, and so uh, I published a second book called uh, you are here around the world in 92 minutes of the best 150 photographs of the world. 
because when you first get to orbit, your eyes are immediately drawn, well, your, your body's drawn to the window and your eyes are drawn to the world. You want to see what the world truly looks like from this entirely new vantage point. It's every astronaut's favorite hobby, it is seeing the world. And it's not just a glance, it's, it's um, a lingering, ever-increasing intimacy and awareness of understanding with the world. And it constantly changes underneath you. And so at first, you, you, you just look for the stuff that you're expecting to see. You want to see the big cities and the places you've been and, and the obvious things. But after a while, it's the subtleties that really take over and the surprises and the, and the delicacies of the, the visual delicacies of the world. And uh, to have had half a year to, uh, to soak those in through my eyes and then do my best to, to try and take some, uh, some pictures of them was just an amazing understanding of the planet itself, but also a great way to share with other people what the world truly looks like, and therefore um, maybe how we should change our thinking about the world that we all share. I served uh, 21 years with the Canadian Space Agency. It's longer than uh, longer than just about any astronaut. Uh, it's it's a uh, many, many years of, of training and preparation, uh, which I loved. But since I've retired from that, uh, it has opened up opportunities to do things I never had time to do before. Uh, music that I've written, especially music that I wrote at the space station, has now been set to full orchestral arrangement. And now I have the chance to stand up in front of a whole bunch of people who have never had a chance to fly in space and try to describe it to them in the best way I know how, which is with imagery on big screens above and around me, with words trying to describe uh, the things that I've seen, but then and with music, and not just myself and a guitar singing, but with the full orchestra and symphony filling in the, um, the music that I always hear in my head anyway, uh, trying to show people at so many different levels what exploration means to me, how it feels, but also uh, try and communicate the, uh, the unspoken importance of discovery and of, uh, of perspective and of the essence of exploration itself. I think maybe there's the misperception that there's some farm where we breed astronauts or something. It's not true. We're all born average Joes. We just, at some point in life, set our sights on something beyond the horizon and decided to pursue the higher education and the, the physical fitness and the um, decision-making skills that allow you to be selected as an astronaut. Uh, eventually, spaceships will be simple enough that we don't require that, that honed and polished and, and very um, selected subset of skills that currently astronauts need to have just to make it successful and safe. Eventually, just like in aviation, we won't all just be Blario or the Wright brothers. Eventually, it'll be commercial and people will be able to experience spaceflight. But we're still in early days, and right now, there are no passengers on spaceships. Even the least qualified person on a ship, a very wealthy paying passenger, it's still a six or nine month venture just to be a safe, unobtrusive passenger on board. Eventually, we'll get there, but. Uh, but we still have many years of invention and proving and testing and, uh, and uh, new engine technology and improved safety uh, before average shows will have a chance to see the wonder of space. I decided to be an astronaut when I was nine years old. I pursued it ever since. It took 26 years until my first space flight. And then I was lucky enough to fly in space three times, um, serving the 21 years with the Canadian Space Agency and NASA and Roscosmos. Uh, now that I've retired, I finally have some free time to pursue other things. I, I really focused on being a good astronaut. But since then, now I can go back to school. I'm really interested in the history of our species, and, and not just the paleontology of it, but looking at the human genome and, and digging in and finding out you know, how related we are to Neanderthals or Cro-Magnon or, or all of the other weird interplay that has led us to where we are. We're learning so much about um, the fundamental nature of life itself. It's fascinating to me. I'm also interested in geology. I want to write a lot more music. 
I teach at university. Uh, I'm on the Space Advisory Board for Canada. Uh, I, I work with elementary schools across the country um, because uh, I think that's important and I just tie in with their classrooms using Skype. And this book is being made into a, a sitcom on ABC in, in America. So that's keeping me busy as well. It's called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. So um, there's, there's lots of things coming on the horizon. Build on what you've done and constantly be uh, challenging fate to see what opportunities might come next. Imagine next time that you were sitting on the toilet that suddenly there was no gravity. Picture it. It's messy. You'd float off the seat, nothing would stay in the toilet, anything coming out of your body would just go every which way. It's, it's not, not a pleasant sight. We really rely on gravity uh, to use the loo. And um, in space, we need a functioning toilet because the stuff that comes out of your body is, is actually poisonous. So in place of gravity pulling everything down into the toilet, we have uh, airflow pulls everything down into the toilet. So it's, it's like sitting on, um, uh, on a place where the wind is all blowing down your body and into the toilet itself. And so the liquids get pulled into one tube and the solids into sort of a container. And, and you clean up afterwards just like on Earth. And the liquids get recycled back into drinking water just like they do on Earth. The solids uh, become just part of our, uh, our rubbish on the space station, carefully sealed so that it stays healthy and eventually jettisoned. And actually, eventually jettison and fall down and burn up in the atmosphere. Um, so the next time you're wishing on a falling star, you might want to rethink what you're looking at. You know, I think a, a mountain climber, when, when they're halfway up a cliff face, would agree there's not much creature comfort there. But they can rig up a, a suspended tent and a flat surface and sleep in a sleeping bag and be somewhat comfortable. But they're trading it for the incredible human adventure and the view that you get from a cliff. And space flight is sort of like that. It's not comfortable. You know, you're, you're away from family, uh, you never lie in a bed, your food is all in little packets, and, and even your, your coffee or tea you have to drink from a bag all the time. It's not a comfortable existence, but it's a magnificent existence. And I think um, you can trade off a lot of the things that you like, like the princess and the pea, that, that, that make you comfortable if what's happening in life is... Uh, is exciting and rewarding and, and the stuff of dreams. Um, and there's very few things that I really need if, um, if the magic of uh, the things that I'm dreaming about are actually happening around me. If I'd been in the film Gravity, I would have rewritten the script. <laughs> the, I mean, they changed the laws of physics and the characters were were so unrepresentative of how astronauts are chosen and are trained and behave and, and the vehicles were very unrealistic. The, the visuals were good. The, the, the idea of doing a spacewalk looked about right, but, but uh, the sequence of events was, was beyond improbable. Uh, Sandra Bullock described it as an amusement park ride and, and that's what it really was. It's, uh, I, I, uh, if I were in the movie Gravity, I would really want to be a lot more involved with, um, with my particular set of biases as to, as to uh, what constitutes uh, a factual and therefore a, uh, a good movie.